Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ed Steinfeld. I'm the director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. It is my um, true pleasure today to welcome Sylvester James Gates, Jim Gates, uh, here to Brown, uh, where he is, in fact, a visiting faculty member already. Uh, and Jim is going to speak on the topic of a retros re retrospective on science and evidence-based policy formation. Uh, this talk is uh, based, at least in part, on Professor Gates' experience serving from 2009 to, to 2017 to earlier this year on PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Uh, while serving on PCAST, Professor Gates co-chaired the working group for STEM education and provided uh, at least two reports that I know of, four reports, sorry, uh, <laughs> on, on recommendations on STEM education uh, in the United States. Uh, professor Gates is the Distinguished University Professor, University System of Maryland Regents Professor, and John S. Toll Professor of Physics at the University of Maryland, uh, where he's known for his pioneering work in, in supersymmetry and supergravity, uh, areas closely related to string theory. Uh, professor Gates earned not one, but two undergraduate degrees uh, at MIT, uh, one in mathematics and one in physics. I would say for myself, having served for 17 years on the MIT faculty and having never earned a degree at MIT, I have some sense of what an accomplishment it is to earn <laughs> two undergraduate uh, bachelors of science degrees. Uh, Professor Gates uh, received his PhD in physics from MIT as well. Uh, he served after that as a postdoc at Caltech and also as a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows program. Uh, as an indicator of the monumental and ongoing arc of Professor Gates' career, he now also holds honorary doctorates from the University of Western Australia, uh, Loyola University of Chicago, and Georgetown University. Uh, Professor Gates is the author of over 200 research papers and also co-author of the 1983 landmark book, Superspace, or 1001 Lessons in Supersymmetry, which is the first comprehensive work in I believe, the, really the seminal work on supersymmetry. Uh, Professor Gates has been featured, as I'm sure you know, in numerous documentaries and videos, uh, some of which explay for, explain for lay audiences, such as myself, the nature of string theory, uh, others of which inspire exploration into the relationship between religion and science, and still others which inspire um, young people and older people to get involved in physics and, and STEM-related topics more generally. I've been a big consumer of these documentaries and videos. I'm, I'm inspired by them in my own work. Uh, for his contributions to science and research, Professor Gates was awarded the National Medal of Science by President Barack Obama in 2013. The, the award is, um, as you know, of course, one of the highest in the land, but it, it really only hints, I think, at the tremendous contributions that Professor Gates has made and, and the leadership, really, that he's exercised um, in pushing the frontiers of knowledge, of course for Americans, but for humankind more generally. On that note, uh, Professor Gates, I want to turn the floor over to you, and again, thank you so much for coming today. Well, good day to everyone. Let's see if we can figure out how to get this technology to work here. Uh, we're failing so far. Let's see. Okay. There we go. Uh, first of all, it's my great pleasure to be here to speak. Thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, this is one of my relatives. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to understand that we both spent time at MIT and the uh, provost also. So there's a kind of, when you meet MIT people, there's kind of a cultural affinity that you recognize pretty quickly because the place really does have a distinctive culture that imprints itself on people's personality. So it's kind of obvious when you kind of meet folks. It's like, oh, now I know why this person feels familiar. <laughs> um, so it's my great pleasure to be here. Um, I also uh, want to thank you for not pointing out that I do frivolous things like show up in TV commercials. So, uh, I, in my career at this point in my life, I've done two TV commercials, one for TurboTax and one for Verizon. And those things, don't ask me where they come from, but I, uh, at 66, I still find that I'm willing to take a dare. Someone dares me to do something. I'm like that bad 14, 15-year-old kid said, yeah, I'll take that dare and I'll do it. So uh, it drives my enthusiasm in life. So uh, in uh, 2009, I was on my way to India. And I, I was in the airport in uh, Amsterdam. 
And I got an email message from uh, Harold Varmus. And the email message was, Jim, I'd like to talk to you. And my response was, well, I'm on my way to India. I'll be back in about 10 days. Well, let's talk when we get back. And so I got back. I was waiting for this message from Harold, and nothing showed up. And I thought, well, whatever it is, it, it has gone away. It's not important that he speak to me anymore. About four or five days later, I get a second message from Harold. Still want to talk to you, Jim. Uh, when can we do this? I'm like, Harold, your life is far more complicated than mine. Whenever you think you have an open, free moment, just reach out to me, and I'll try to make myself available. Another couple of days go by, I don't hear anything. And so at this point, I'm beginning to wonder what's going on with Harold. So finally, uh, uh, at the end of March, early April, I was going to give a physics colloquium at the University of Florida in Gainesville. And I'm in the airport, I get off the plane, and my mobile phone rings, and it's Harold. And as soon as I recognize his voice, I'm like, Harold, what is wrong with you? You keep sending me messages that you want to talk, but you never actually then follow up and have a conversation with me. Uh, and so he says, well, Jim, uh, I have a question for you. And the question is, if you were invited to serve on the U.S. President's Council on Science and Technology, what would be your answer? Now, notice the formulation of the question. <laughs> That's the first thing I know. It's like, it's not that we're extending this invitation to you, but if we did, uh, what would be your response? And I thought, started thinking, hmm, this is interesting. Sounds like a politician at work to me, uh, because obviously they want to be in a position of having someone say, oh, I, I was offered and I turned it down. Well, you know, if it's conditional, then you were never actually offered. But I have to tell you, my knees went weak, because I knew what the U.S. President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology was. And I'm going to talk a little bit of the history about that for those of you who may not be familiar with PCAST, as it's called. And as I said, I had to lean up against the wall not to fall down because I understood the first of the uh, enormous honor that was extended by this invitation as well as the challenge. Because you see, uh, as mentioned in the introduction, uh, I really am, uh, well, I'm not Sheldon Cooper, for you young people in the audience, but I work on that stuff. I actually have spent my entire adult life working on the mathematics that's most closely associated with string theory. And so I don't think of myself as a natural policy formation wonk, but nonetheless, I knew that that's what I was being invited to try and attempt to discharge. My father served 27 years in the U.S. Army. So in our family, we actually have a kind of a tradition of providing service to this country, and it's something that we think is of extraordinary value. So I had no choice, at least I felt I had no choice in responding to Harold's question because I had never served in the military. And I, in the back of my mind, I, you know, that's a deficit because dad did and I didn't. And now suddenly there was a chance for me to contribute to this great country of ours that has given each of us so very much in terms of the quality of our lives. It's not perfect, there's room for improvement, but if we don't each contribute, then that improvement doesn't actually occur. So it's actually incumbent upon us to take these opportunities, in my opinion. So I said yes, and I accepted uh, the invitation. And then uh, late April of that year, the US, uh, President Obama, in a meeting at the National Science uh, Academy, National Academy of Sciences, introduced his advisory group to the world in a meeting. And there were 20 of us there, Ernie Moniz, uh, who uh, was uh, our just previous Secretary of Energy, was among those initial advisors. I had known Ernie since 1977 because he had been in my PhD thesis, the Defense Committee. So I had known Ernie forever. Uh, Shirley Jackson, uh, the president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I had known Shirley since the summer of 69 because she was my first physics teacher. So some of these people were very familiar to me and had obviously gone on and made a name for themselves. And, and then there's me. And I'm like, wow, you know, like, how do I get to hang out with a crowd like this? And so we began our work. Uh, the president made it very clear that he would depend on this group uh, for a much broader array of advice than had traditionally been the role of PCAST. In fact, let me start by characterizing the vision that I got from both President Obama and science advisor Dr. John Holdren. 
their vision was that PCAST was to use scientific means and methods to leverage those means and methods for the benefit of the country in policy formation far outside of the, do the domain of science itself. This is a different kind of vision. Traditionally, PCAST has mostly worried about the health of science and what the government can do to support that health and make sure that the research opportunities are there, which provide the seed corn for future technologies. I, I like to remind general audiences that the wealthiest man in the world owes his wealth to the fact that the government invested in a small agency at the end of the 60s called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. That's what led to the creation of email, which ultimately led to the creation of the Internet, which now, of course, is an enormous source of wealth for countries around the world. And that shows the role of government. Government is the foundational investor, at least in science and technology, that is later exploited by businesses and corporations to create enormous wealth and increase the quality of life of our citizens. So that's the picture one should have in mind. And normally that's all PKS had done. But this president, this science advisor, said, no, we want a larger role for science technology because uh, the president himself, well, he's described himself as a closet geek. This past president, President Obama, for whatever reasons, had and has a, an affinity for science. Now, this is extraordinarily unusual. And it's something that I've actually tried to figure out how this came to be. And I have a theory, but not a theory in the sense that I use the word as a scientist, but it's a guess. Um, President Obama, uh, in law school, interned with, uh, uh, let's see, uh, Robert Tribe? Is that the name? Larry Tribe at the law school. And there is this paper that Lawrence Tribe wrote. And the title of the paper, if I remember correctly, is called The Curvature of the Law. And what the paper explores is something very interesting. Uh, in physics in the 20s and 30s, a revolution occurred. Quantum mechanics is part of that revolution. General relativity, relativity is part of that revolution. And so this paper by Tribe asks the question whether there is anything to learn from these experiences in science that is relevant to understanding the operation of the law. So it's a very unusual paper. But of course, Lawrence Tribe, for, I don't actually know Lawrence, but I've heard from many, many people who's an astounding intellect. So it's the kind of question you would expect someone like that to ultimately get to. And he did. I have a copy of that paper on my computer somewhere. And if you look in the footnotes of that computer, you'll find that an intern by the name of Barack H. Obama is acknowledged in that paper. And so I have, my guess is that that was likely a large part of why President Obama was disposed to think about science outside of its traditional boundaries in terms of just as the developer of technology, but that it could be used as a force, a leveraging uh, mechanism for increasing evidence-based policymaking. So with that back, as background, I'd like to talk a little bit about experiences. And then we're going to, at the end of the talk, we're going to neck down to a specific uh, example of how PCAST uh, has done something which uh, you don't know about, but which make, will, I predict, make an enormous difference in the future. So this is the government, basically. It's an org chart. Uh, the Constitution, of course, is our foundational uh, uh, player in this, the three branches of governor, the, the departments of defense, agriculture, commerce, and these are the enabling parts of what at least some people claim they're trying to disestablish these days. Uh, if you open up, let me come around here because it's easier for me to see, if you open up just the uh, executive branch, you find out that uh, on the right hand side over here, you see the President, the Office of Homeland Security. I'm sorry, I can't quite make this out. My eyes are not as good as they used to be. Uh, National Security Council, I'm sorry, uh, National Security Council, uh, about which we heard some interesting news a couple of hours ago. Um, the Secretary of Homeland Security. And so the executive branch is enormous, 
But one of the parts of the executive branch is the Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP. So OSTP is headed by the science advisor. So Dr. John Holdren was the president science advisor, therefore he was the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. You will note that we currently have no science advisor. The country has no science advisor now. This is the first time that this has been true since World War II, effectively. There was a brief period uh, under the Bush administration there was no science advisor, but actually, eventually Jack Marburger, a very distinguished physicist, became the science advisor. But our country has no science advisor right now. PCAS, the advisor group that, I'm, that I served in, which has direct access to the President of the United States. Our charge is that our advice goes to the President, or went to the President. Well, if there's no science advisor, there's no PCAST. And that means that right now, our President receives zero advice on issues of science, technology, and engineering. Zero advice. Now, many of us are hopeful that that situation will change, because no matter what your sentiments are about the capacities of this current president, we all have a stake in making sure that this country continues along the path towards justice and freedom that in its over 200 year history it has evinced. So we're hopeful that there will be a science advisor. I can tell you I know one person who that will not be because I simply could not tolerate that. But I'm hoping that some accomplished individual will take up that challenge and cut and, uh, and burden, because it will be. So PCAST is responsible for advising the president. And here you can see the OSTP director in the center. And as you can see, PCAST, because of this org chart, means that, yep, we have a direct line to the president. In fact, uh, in, I'm going to show you some pictures of some of our meetings. In the time that I was in PCAS, we met with the president uh, on all seven years. A minimum of the meetings would be an hour duration. And so I've spent over 20 hours uh, in the same room uh, with President Barack Obama. As I said, OSTP director is actually dual headed because the OSTP director is, in fact, the chairman of PCAS, but he is also the science advisor to the President of the United States. And in this capacity, this is a congressionally, uh, uh, congressionally appointed position, so you have to actually be vetted by Congress. So that's the government, at least for the purposes of this discussion today. We live in a world where there's lots of change. So let's look at some of this change. Uh, so uh, one of the things that's really peculiar about our time is that knowledge has become much more directly linked to wealth formation. This is a new thing in human history. Now, knowledge was always weakly linked, because if you stop and think about, for example, the prosecution of wars, the, side, the better technology typically wins. And so knowledge has always been linked. But now we live in an era in which knowledge linkage to wealth formation is much more tightly uh, established and realized. So you have to worry about education. So this is a chart which uh, was put together by OECD uh, from the period of 1995 to 2005. And what it shows is basically uh, qualification, uh, education qualifications. And in uh, 1995, the country of Korea was 25th. By 2005, it was first in terms of the percentage of its population that had completed college education and was prepared for this challenge of, not of wealth based creation on knowledge. Uh, in the same period, we look at Japan, we went from 11 to number 4. We can go look at Finland, which went from 14 to number 10. We can look at Ch uh, Chile, which went from 26 to 26. Well, they were trading water in the entire period. Uh, we can look at Argentina, it went from 28 to 33. Well, that's sort of the wrong direction. In this environment in which knowledge and wealth are tied together. And we can look at Mexico from 36 to 41. 
And then we can look at the United States. In 1995, we were number one in terms of the percentage of our population that was prepared to engage in wealth creation based on knowledge. By 2005, we had dropped to number nine. So we also were not going in the right direction in this period. Um, this is basically emphasizing the same point, but there's more change in the world. So there's an organization called the Global Challenges Foundation that two years ago looked at the greatest challenges to our species. And in fact, they listed them. Uh, climate change in fact is number one. Even though there are people in our country and in our government who are not sure that climate change is an actual threat to humanity. One of the most peculiar things about our government, which I like to point out to people, is that if you look at the government and ask what part of the government is most prepared to deal with climate change, I bet you won't be able to guess. It's the Pentagon. The Department of Defense of this country for over a decade has been preparing for climate change and is the most aggressive agency in the United States government that deals with the issue of climate change. So at least some parts of our government get this very, very intently. Um, super volcanoes, synthetic biology, well, CRISPR, and some of you know about this new technology for rewriting the genome, means that you can think about bio threats coming out of someone's garage where you used to have to have large, enormous investments in equipment. <coughs> nanotechnology has both a good and a bad side. We're starting to see nanotechnology products, and in fact, uh, one of my friends is a guy named uh, Chad Mirkin. Uh, who works in nanotechnology. Chad recently uh, received the Sackler Prize, and he has spun off several companies. He's a professor of chemistry at Northwestern, and in particular, he, his, one of his companies developed something called spherical nucleic acids. So what they do is they take nucleic acids and hand, uh, arrange them in the shape of a sphere, the center of the sphere is hollow, and it turns out that this is a, uh, this is a geometry that nature never produces, and these objects are permeable to the cell wall. So they present a new way to deliver therapies to sell, and it's coming out of nanotechnology. Uh, other things are changing. You know, in our world, we're used to if you do something bad and you stop, then it gets to be good again, right? And this sort of is uh, what you see in these sort of so-called normal distributions. But our world is now changing in such a way that these, this sort of intuitive understanding of the relationship between bad action and bad outcomes is starting to change. In particular, there are these things called fat tail distributions. Now, fat tail distribution is, means basically you're doing something bad, and then you decide to stop and, decide, and allow something good to develop. Well, it turns out that for fat tail distribution, so you go up here, you're doing something, doing something bad, then you stop right there, and then if it were sort of the, your normal expectation, you kind of expect a really good turnaround where good stuff starts to happen. But there are lots of processes that we call fat tail distributions, which we can now see playing out both in nature and economics. <sighs> recessions is one place that's starting to demonstrate this. So if you look at the history of recessions over the course of, uh, 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 since the, uh, after the Second World War, so, uh, recessions normally follow sort of the inverse of that picture I showed you. Turn the bell curve upside down. So it's getting bad, bad, bad. Then we do the right economic policy, then it starts to reverse and the economy heals itself. But uh, here's the recession of 2001 plotted out. And by the way, this is months past the beginning of the recession versus economic growth that you see on this axis. And what you can see is that the recession of 2001 is an outlier because it took over 32 months before you begin to see the healing process in the economy resume. Other changes, well, we're all in love with digital technology. From our mobile phones to Facebook, they're all, this is, these are the platforms. Uh, for young people, it means that the young people in this room, uh, folks my age refer to, we have a term for you, we call you digital natives. Because you were born at a time where digital technology and communications was well formed, and it was in fact part of your developmental phase as a young person. And as a teacher, because I'm still teaching, I've been teaching every year since 1972, I can tell you, in the classroom, you feel differently to me than, say, 10 or 15 years ago. And I think it has something to do with your engagement with digital technology and the social media that arises from that. 
The other thing has changed is the rate of change itself. This is a set of slides that we'll use to illustrate this. Um, unfortunately, the colors are not very good here, but uh, this goes from uh, around 1896 to 1948, and it's a plot of a, of a technology that starts in uh, the 1800s, and 1948 has 150 million users. Anybody want to guess what the technology is? It's a telephone. It took that long for 150 million users in the world to have access to telephones. Uh, there's another technology that was in like 1928, uh, so that by 19, uh, I'm sorry about the colors here. Jeez, uh, I'm sorry. And my slides are misbehaving too. But the second line I was going to show you was television. The, the final one on this, in fact, let me just advance the slide completely where we can see all of these, because this is, in fact, the summary. <coughs> see as the rate of change of uptake of modern technology itself is increasing. So that if you look at something like Facebook, it took five years to go from essentially zero users to over 150 million users. <coughs> Our world is beset by other problems. Terrorism. What are we going to do with that? <sighs> Big data and privacy. I have to tell, I'll tell you a story about uh, big data and privacy, which was to me one of the most inspiring experiences with President Obama. Uh, our PCAS did a report on big data and privacy in 2012. And this was right after the Snowden leaks. And what was amazing to me in that meeting was President Obama called for this report. He wasn't calling for the report to deal with the leaks. Instead, the questions he was after and we wanted to get some uh, responses to, is what are basic American rights that we have taken for granted in this new environment where data can be transmitted almost instantly, where it's essentially impossible to be secure. Now this is, comes as a surprise to many people because you think you have a password and that protects your stuff. About 10 years ago, the president of my campus, University of Maryland, was in a meeting with uh, a number of other presidents at the FBI, and the briefer ran a very simple experiment. The briefer said, just give me some piece of information, not your social media, just give me something. And some people in the audience uh, did so. And the briefer, using technology that was available to hackers in Russia, was able to get to the person's social security number, bank accounts numbers, all of that. That was 10 years ago. So privacy, although people don't understand that generally, privacy really does not exist any longer. So when you hear about all the spying and stuff, it's been that way for over a decade. It's just not publicly discussed. We also have a challenge I like to call A square, I square, TR. That's uh, automation, artificial intelligence, information technology, and robotics. Because these are the things that are roiling our society in terms of productivity. Uh, this is a picture of the first self-driving car experimented by Uber. I remember when I saw this picture, I thought, I'll never buy a car with a trash can on top. <laughs> <laughs> but very quickly, we move along to today's self-driving vehicles. And this one down here on the end here, uh, I can't, uh, this one on the end here is a Tesla. I was born in 1950. I'm a car guy. I look at that car, and my heart goes a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> so I wouldn't mind having a self-driving one of those. But they're also self-driving 18-wheelers. Again, a development that uh, has been lost in most of our media discussion. Uh, this is a picture of the Mercedes-Benz self-driving 18-wheeler. Uh, it's been in production for about five years now. Um, it's street legal in Nevada, and recently there appeared this story uh, in Colorado where one of these self-driving vehicles delivered uh, a, a load of Budweiser beer from the factory to a vendor. Now you might not care about that so much until you stop and think that somewhere between 2.4 and 3.2 million Americans make their living in transportation of goods and services by long haul freight. And then you can begin to see what the problem is going to be. Because this technology, you don't have to let it rest as a driving long haul. It can drive at night just as well as it drives in the day. It's more effective. And if you're the owner of a trucking firm, where do you see your future business going? 
probably not be containing a lot of drivers. And so this is going to be an enormous social disruption, I expect. I, and this is part of what seems to be, has been happening since the 70s. Wealth in our country has gone, undergone this really strange process where uh, before the, uh, up until about the uh, middle of the 90s, as the country's productivity increased, so did the average income of the middle class. But now we live in an era where the productivity of the country continues to increase, but the average income of the middle class has at best stagnated. So, that's the world you live in. And now you're some college professor who's been called upon to give advice to the President of the United States to deal with some of these problems. And all you're used to doing is writing equations and looking at factors too. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, you have to be very fortunate, and I was. Uh, uh, let me first tell you that members of uh, groups like PCAST, we, we are not and were not part of the administration. We're what's called government special employees, and the government lays this out. We had a tremendous, we get, do get a tremendous salary, though, of zero dollars per hour. But there are actually regulations on our behavior, even though we're not paid by the government. So the privilege of advising the government, you basically have to sign confidentiality and get clearances and do all kinds of stuff. So I was one of those. PCAST, as I said, is this organization that uh, has been around in one form or another since the Second World War. Uh, it was informally in the Second World War led by Dr. Vannevar Bush, one of MIT's presidents, who provided scientific advice to President Roosevelt as this country was prosecuted in the Second World War, and of course that also includes nuclear weapons. So that's where this tradition gets started, with science advice directly to the President. Um, PCAST's uh, name has changed several times, and PCAST has even disappeared for a while because during the Nixon administration, this group was called upon to give advice on, uh, on uh, supersonic transports and the impact that they would have on the environment. And the group concluded that the risk of having large fleets of supersonic aircraft, the threat, threat to the environment was so great and the benefits so small that it recommended that our country not go forward with the development of this, this particular technology. Now, of course, one country did. That was France. She developed the Concorde, which unfortunately proved to be economically uh, unsustainable. So there are no more Concords. But the point was that Nixon was so upset with this group for giving this advice that he actually disbanded the group. And so for uh, most of his administration, there was no defense. This condition remained true up until the administration of the first President Bush when PCAS was formally reinstated as part of the advisory uh, system for the president, and since continuously since the operation of the uh, first President Bush, there has been a PCAS, and it has advised the president. Uh, this is a, one of our meetings. Uh, PCAS, as I said, uh, 20 individuals. Uh, we're spread across the disciplinary boundaries. I'm a physicist, but we had economists, uh, we had biologists, uh, chemists. We also had, for example, Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, was a member of PCAS. Craig Mundy, the number three man, the uh, chief strategy, strategy officer uh, at Microsoft, was a member of PCAS. Rick Levin, the president of Yale, was a member of PCAS. Shirley Jackson, president of Rensselaer Polytechnic. So it's not just eggheads. It's people spread across the spectrum in terms of activity. And this particular meeting uh, took place in 2012. Uh, in this meeting, I actually had a chance to brief the president. As you can see, I'm sitting across from the president. I, I like to point out to people that um, in those days, my hair was longer and darker than it is now. <laughs> You've seen pictures of presidents. They come in with all this nice dark hair, and then when they go out of office, the hair is usually shorter and whiter. That happens to people around the president, too. <laughs> So this particular briefing uh, was on STEM education. Uh, as mentioned uh, in the introduction, uh, that was my expected portfolio to carry in the activities of PCAS. Whenever we were delving in the realm of STEM education, uh, I was expected to be basically be the lead author. We produced four reports on STEM education. The first one was K-12. It's called Prepare and Inspire. 
It's, a, mm -hmm. a, a, it's an effort to improve the way the K-12 education works to produce the citizens who can meet this knowledge challenge. The second report is Engage to Excel. It's focused on the first two years of post-secondary education. A lot of people like to say that the past administration wants everybody to go to college. That's not true. What the past administration would like is for people to get education beyond high school. These are not the same two things. You can do education beyond high school by going to a community college, by going into a certificated program, but the point is to get the training beyond high school, because high school is not going to cut it in this little time. Our third report, uh, interesting, left was on MOOCs. Uh, on STEM education because there was an uh, effort to what well, these computer driven courses would somehow destroy universities. Uh, in our report to the president, we told them no, they're not going to touch the university. In fact, it's, it's premature to even make a judgment of government investment in this technology. And then our fourth report was on uh, reskilling and retraining the workers. What kind of mechanisms could the government create to help incentivize other organizations and groups to have in place systems? where a worker displaced from one technology-based industry will get the training to be able to go and get another uh, sort of gainful job. You can see this happening in our economy right now. Uh, there's a, there was a wonderful story in the New York Times about three years ago about it, a woman who had been um, in social work. She retrained to become a medical tech. She became the primary breadwinner of the family after this retraining. And the husband, who had spent his career Working as an auto mechanic, the opportunity, economic opportunities for him became less and less. And so looking at his wife's example, they concluded he needs to go to the two, local two-year community college so he could get retrained. But he, he did not succeed. And the, to me, the most poignant thing about that story is that in the story, the wife says he was tripped up by the man. What a sorry excuse for hurting someone's life. They were tripped up by the man. And that's what's happening to millions of our fellow citizens. Not folks like you, because obviously you wouldn't be in this room unless you come from a certain privileged class of our society. But there are millions of other Americans who are not like you, who are not like my family and those of us, who, whose life and economic expectations are tied to their inability do algebra, or at least to be able to think of, in the modes that algebra teaches you to think about. That's the trick. So that's a big problem for our nation. This president was committed to uh, a number of, the past president was committed to a number of things, uh, investing in building blocks, promoting competitive markets to spur innovation, uh, catalyze breakthroughs in national priorities, and this was represented by the fact that the past administration had more high-level accomplished scientists in it than any administration in the history of the country. Uh, there were five Nobel laureates in science that were part of the government, including Steve Chu, uh, Carl Wyman, um, Harold Varmus, uh, Mario Molina, and Ahmed Zouel. Um, Varmus uh, uh, was serving as a uh, director of the National Cancer Institute uh, after he left PCAS. And Ahmed Zouel and uh, Mario Molina were on PCAS. They were colleagues of mine on PCAS. By the way, uh, Molina, uh, most of you have never heard of, but you might remember the ozone hole. He's one of the chemists that figured out the connection between our spray cans and producing that ozone hole. That's the work for which he won his Nobel Prize. <laughs> and Ahmed Zouel was the, is the only Egyptian born person in history to receive the Nobel Prize in science. Uh, Ahmed unfortunately died about a year ago uh, while he was on, serving on PCAT. Uh, some new, other new things happened. Uh, an, a chief information officer was established in this past administration, someone directly tied to using information for government. And the EPA, which now finds itself under great attack, was actually led by a scientist in those days. This is our PCAT. Uh, I could, uh, I'm not going to spend time naming everyone here, but these are now my brothers and sisters. They feel like brothers and sisters, so I know each of them rather well. Uh, let me just point out one individual. This is Dr. John Holdren. He was the science advisor to President Obama. Uh, this is Ernie Muniz. He just finished serving as your energy secretary. And uh, that's Mario, who I just commented about. Um, Rick Levin, former president of Yale. Uh, Bill Press, an incredible guy. 
uh, University of Texas Austin professor of mathematics, physics, and integrated biology. Just an incredible uh, resource for the country. Former associate director of uh, Los Alamos. That's Chad Mirkin, the guy I was telling you earlier who developed this new uh, delivery of uh, pharmaceuticals for uh, treatments for cells, circumnucleic acids. And that was our PCAS. So as you can see, this president that we just lost made the investment of reaching out to people with deep roots in science and technology. We would meet with him uh, typically between three and four times a year, always in the White House. Uh, this meeting here, in fact, was our very first meeting in the White House with him. Sometimes the vice president would sit in. And the vice president, by the way, is a lovely man. I, I know the public persona uh, of the vice president that he's kind of a flake. That's not really your, uh, that is not Joe Biden. Joe Biden is an incredible individual. If you ever have a chance to interact with me with him, you'll, you'll marvel at the difference between his public persona, what's stated in, in the press, versus the actual individual. The fact that he didn't run for uh, president is a testament to who he is as a person. Uh, and you'll notice in this picture I'm sitting next to the president. That doesn't always happen. I used to say that, uh, like to say that our PCAS meetings were like a game of musical chairs. Because at various meetings, each one of them would be seated next to the president. And I think the whole purpose of that so that you could go out and say, I sat next to the president. <laughs> <laughs> and every one of us got a chance to say that after at least one meeting. Right? So that's the only reason I can figure out why they kept moving us around. And so what we did, we became the presidential think tank. We produced 39 reports in the seven years that I served on PCAS. This is more reports than any PCAS in history has ever produced. And it was that way because the president put so much on our agenda to be done. I'm going to go through some of these with you. I won't go through the entire 39 of them. Uh, so the first report we did with the president was preparation for H1N1. Maybe you'll remember back in 2009, we were worried about this flu virus that might cause a pandemic and destroy tens of thousands of people's lives here in the country. And the president came to our group and asked a simple question, how well prepared are we for this? And so this was our first report to the president. It was led by, uh, by uh, Eric Lander, uh, the uh, director of the Broad uh, Genetics Research Institute in Cambridge. Our next report was on tech nanotechnology. Then we went back to the influenza virus because something very interesting happened. When we were looking at the country's preparation for uh, dealing with uh, a pathogen like H1N1, we learned that the country's capacity for developing uh, inoculants rested on chicken eggs. Now, you know, you have to really wonder about that. It's like, can't we do better than, this is a 100-year-old technology over here. Can't we do something better? Well, there's this thing called recombinant DNA technology out there, folks. And so what we pointed out was, why are we using chicken eggs as part of the developmental cycle to scale up the production of vaccines when there's this perfectly new technology over here that could be used in place of it? And so the second report starts to deal with how to move vaccination technology out from 100 years ago and bring it up so that we can scale it up rapidly for pathogens. Now, this actually has two benefits, which are, well, one is you'll deal with possible epidemics, but the other benefit is it, per, it sets us up in a better position to deal with bioterrorism, because you're going to also need inoculants to probably feed the population if you have a serious bioterrorism incident. And so by doing good on the natural side, you also start to protect against terrorism. This was our first demand report, the one on K-12 education that I led. Uh, then we looked at uh, the energy technology. It turns out that the grid for our country has lots of issues. You might think that we have a great electrical or power grid. It's not so great. We were trying to move the industry along and, and increasing its effectiveness. And then this, health IT. You know, health, we always talk about health care in the country. We probably had the world's among advanced societies, we probably have the world's most inefficient health delivery service. Uh, there have been studies that estimate that this country spends about $700 million that's simply wasted in our health care system because of the way that we do it. 700, almost a billion dollars. 
And so we were trying to find ways that you could in, use information technology to improve that situation. The leverage point was going to be the uh, Veterans Administration because a large part of delivering health uh, via the government is for veterans. I have to tell you, we failed. Although we found some technologies that would have improved things, they have not been implemented to this day. And now, of course, that should tell you something about the game of uh, when you get into public policy, the, the government officials. Just because you make a recommendation doesn't mean they have to follow it. Because remember, they're paying us zero dollars. So they don't lose anything if they, and, and, and the real truth is, they're often incumbent stakeholders whose interests are being threatened by moving to new technologies. And that in, that in a political system like ours generates enormous resistance to change. Um, just let you read some titles. And the topics are over here in red, so you can see. And this one I'm going to, this one I'm going to come back to and talk about in some detail because it illustrates some very interesting things for people who are thinking about, about doing policy formation across the domain of science and technology and, and uh, traditional policy. Drug innovation, research enterprise. Yes, we actually did worry about the research enterprise. But this is what PCAS used to only do. As you can see here, this is only one, this is like one-tenth of what the, the past few tests actually worried about. Agricultural preparedness, climate change, systems engineering of healthcare. We kept returning to healthcare because there are opportunities for improvement. They haven't generally been implemented. So as I said, that's about half the reports that we did. I didn't want to bore you by showing you the covers of all three planets. We were incredibly busy. We were busy because the president and the science advisor had this vision of PCAS serving a way it had never served before. If you look at PCAS before President Obama, they issued reports. Typically, in the lifetime administration, you might get six reports on it. So six reports in four years. But we issued 39 and 8. So the rate is at least a factor of two greater, almost a factor of three. Uh, what made the difference? Well, the difference, there were a couple of things that, that allowed this productivity to go forward. The first one was that the science advisor, Dr. John Holdren, and President Obama each, well, the way, the colloquial way to say it is that each felt the other had his back. And when you know that you have someone that you can trust to forward mutual uh, vision of progress, you tend to actually depend on that person. So one of the strange things about this relationship between the president and the science advisor was the result that if you look at the major economic policy of our country these days, because remember, we had this terrible crash in 2008, so you have to then figure out what's going to be the tent that you lay out to reverse this economic decline. Now, normally this is a question that's taken up by a group called the National Economic Council, the NEC. But in fact, in our time advising the president, we were the group that established the tent pole. And it's called advanced manufacturing. I don't know how many of you are aware of advanced manufacturing. That came, that policy decision came out of the scientists and technologists, not the Economic Council, which would have been its natural uh, home, uh, place of origin. And so why did it come out of us? Because the president put the question to us. Other presidents might not have done that to their science and technology council. They might have instead gone to the economic competitive group, uh, economic council, and asked the question of them. If you ask a group of scientists a question, and they're dedicated to providing best service, you will often get answers that you won't hear if you go through traditional routes. And that's exactly what happened with advanced manufacturing. I, it started actually with our colleague, Dr. Shirley Jackson, the president of Rensselaer Polytechnic uh, up in the Troy, New York. Uh, she, uh, as she is in her had the duties of president, they had experimented with advanced technology because Troy and Schenectady and Albany and her triangle in upper state New York, they used to be dominated by General Electric. So they were a place that had a history of economic uh, vitality connected to technology. General Electric barely exists anymore. I'm not even sure it does at all. 
And so that had dire economic consequences for the Tri-Cities area of the state of New York. And since Rensselaer is an institution in that area, the sense was that it ought to take responsibility for allowing new economic paths to be developed. And Dr. Jackson undertook that, and the way that they did it was by recognizing that new technology means that two things. A, you can use new technology to make old products in more efficient ways. And B, you can use new technology to actually make new things that you could not make with older technology. And in that Tri-Cities area, they had evidence, this is the first time I've used it up, they had evidence that this was a strategy, a, a policy strategy, that could make a difference. And this now brings me to the use of evidence, because that was part of my title in this talk. In medicine, uh, there is a rubric called evidence-based medicine, which has been underway for over a decade. And the idea is very simple. Namely, that when you pursue therapies and treatments, what you ought to do is follow the evidence as to which will be effective and which will be dead ends. Right? This is not rocket science, right? You would say, of course you should do that. Well, for a large time in medical research, that was not done. And even to this day, the use of evidence based to establish therapeutical treatments has lots of room for improvement. It's a surprise, but it's the situation. So, evidence-based policy making is roughly the equivalent. Namely, that if you're going to establish public policy, that should be done on the basis of evidence. And that explains sort of why PCAS was peculiarly placed in this administration, because science is all about evidence. And science is empirical. I like to say that uh, for those of us who are science, the only difference between science and faith-based belief systems is that we decide our consensus opinion on the basis of evidence. That's what distinguishes us. So if you're thinking about policy formation and you think that evidence might get you to more effective policies, it's not a surprise to say, I'm going to start forming policies on the basis of evidence, as opposed to whatever inherent beliefs I might have. So you might say, I am a conservative, therefore I believe X. Well, evidence-based policy making says, what's the evidence for X? You may say, I'm a liberal, I believe Y. Evidence-based policy making then asks the question, what's the evidence for Y? And that's the whole point about evidence-based. You don't tie the recommendations to an a priori decision about where you fall in the political spectrum. That's the breakthrough. So let me talk about something that you can go find out, because this whole idea of evidence-based policy making may sound to you like it's new. And it is relatively new in the discussion of the way that we think of policy here, but it is not a new development. Uh, it's, it's, in fact, it's so old that even the Wikipedia talks about it. So I've actually just gone to Wikipedia and pulled some points that is a consensus among people. So first, uh, there are six key lessons. Policy processes are complex and rarely linear or logically, and simply presenting information to a policymaker and expecting them to act upon it is very unlikely to work. Policy processes uh, are not pre linear as they have various stages that each stage requires varying lengths of time to complete and, in fact, must be conducted simultaneously. Now, what that means for someone like uh, our PCAS group meant that when we're talking of policies, what we're, going, what we're going to do is look for people who are actually doing innovation in the policy space. And then we're going to ask the question, how does your documentation on the effectiveness of your innovation? Is there room for scaling this up? And if so, what are the levers that the government can do to help that scaling? The government, by the way, can't do anything. Well, I'm sorry, not you. The government can't do as much as it used to do. After World War II, our government was incredibly powerful. In fact, it was the most powerful organization in the country. It is, that's just not true now. Many people don't understand that there's a new distribution of power in our country, and it's now between government and corporations. Corporations now are collectively far more powerful than the government. So if you're thinking about policy, that means that you cannot continue just to talk to the bureaucrats. You have to also now be willing to talk to people in business. 
because a large part of the power to make a difference resides there. And that means partnering. In particular, there's a concept of public-private partnerships, and that's the way many of our efforts were directed in putting together our, our recommendations for president. It's also, currently policy is weakly informed. There are secrecies and gaps. You know, intellectual property among uh, stakeholders is a big issue. So you have to worry about that. And as I'm losing my audience, let me hurry up here. Uh, Research-based evidence can contribute. The need for a holistic understanding is important. Policy entrepreneurial, entrepreneurs actually uh, need skills that are not traditionally found in policy making circles, but in fact are the kinds of skills that scientists and engineers possess. And then finally, uh, they have to have very they have to be very intentional. They actually have to be thinking about the innovation cycle through its entire length. And so this is what evidence-based policy making is about. I want to close with, uh, oops, with one example, and that's this report. Uh, in 2011, the president came to the council and said, you know, there's a problem that uh, the FCC tells us. Um, if you look at the number of people who want access to wireless devices, that number's going up. If you look at the capacity for the electromagnetic spectrum to carry messages, that's a fixed number. These two numbers are going to bump into each other around 2023. At which point, everyone who wants to buy a new wireless phone doesn't have a phone that works. This is a terrible problem. Go find a solution. So uh, we started in uh, 2011, led by a colleague of mine, another MIT alum, a guy named Mark Gorenberg. Uh, Mark Gorenberg uh, was the lead on this author, on this report. And we spent 11 months talking to the experts. And that, that's the involvement where the evidence base comes from. You don't sit up in a think tank and try to figure out the answers. You go talk to people who have the expertise in the area. And so this is what the spectrum allocation looks like. I should tell you, this is the result of the Titanic. And you might wonder, what in the world does that mean? Well, you see, part of the tragedy of the Titanic was that there, were, there was a radio operator on board who tried to actually broadcast the SOS. But there was another ship relatively close by on the same frequency, so not very many people heard the call. As a consequence of that, the FCC, after the Titanic, set up rules for spectrum allocation. You got assigned a, a, a channel, you got assigned a channel, you got assigned a channel, and you're only allowed to use the channels that you were assigned. That's the way spectrum allocation worked, right, ever since the disaster of the Titanic. Now, if you stop and think about that, that's as if you each have a separate railroad. So you have a railroad that you can use. Someone else has a different railroad. But if you, care, if you look at the efficiency of operation of railroad compared to highway, you suddenly realize highways are more efficient because you give a set of rules. And as long as the people on the highway use those rules, all the motion of goods and services actually occurs. So the point becomes, how can you do this with the electromagnetic spectrum? And we found a very simple solution. Namely, use the technology that drives the internet, in fact, to allow access to the spectrum. Now, the internet is very interesting in terms of technological platform, because what happens with the internet is when you create a message, what happens is something called message packaging gets chopped up into little bits, and then it's flung out to the communication system, but it all doesn't have to go through the same wires, the same channel. It can go through different channels because it's a digital system that has instructions about where to go and re reassemble itself. So when it gets to you, part of the message may have come by one means, maybe a cable, maybe a microwave somewhere. But you can do, if we can do that with the internet, you can also do it with radios. And so the report that we gave was, let's import the technologies from the internet to the use of the spectrum. Now when this report first came out, our biggest detractors were Verizon and the big telecoms. They said, oh, that's just a group of those ivory professor Ivy Tower professors weighing on something they don't know about. But when we did our report, you also have to look at the evidence of impact. And all the best indications we found was that we would increase the carrying capacity by a minimum factor of 10 to the 4. After about a year, <laughs> the telecoms figured out that we got that part right. And of course, for them, that means more money. So now, this new way of using the spectrum has enormous support among the telecoms. And so that's the kind of stuff that evidence-based policy making can accomplish. 
So as I said, Mark Gornberg uh, was the chair of the committee. Uh, he's, uh, he was with Hummer Winblad now. He's with a different uh, investment firm now. I was, had the fortunate privilege to be on the committee with Craig, Bill Press, Maxine Savitz, and Eric Schmidt. So we're the people who drove this report. It wasn't us. We engaged over 40 disciplinary experts to get to this solution. If you're willing, maybe we could do some <coughs> Q&A, and then I'll invite everybody to continue the conversation at the reception afterwards. Do, do you want me to help, or would you like to field the questions? Uh, I'm in your house, so you can okay. keep taking the questions. Could I ask you to just use the microphone? Oh, great. Oh, okay, this is in. This is in support of your theory about Obama's interest in science. Mm -hmm. He's reading a book called Three, Three Body. It, it's a Chinese science fiction book translated into English. And he, I've read in the papers, he reads this before he goes to bed at night to clear his mind. It's purely science fiction. The first chapters are filled with quantum mechanics and all the lingo of science stuff that you do, and so I really believe your, your theory. Well, it's the best guess I can do. That's all I can say. <laughs> uh, there's a, yeah, want to pass the microphone, perhaps? <laughs> That's right, forward pass. Uh, so what about, what about incumbents? So, you know, folks, Incumbency. radio telescopes and things like that uh, that worry about the spectrum, or is this only for spectrum that doesn't uh, interfere with um, Geological sensing. Uh, sure. Radio so this astronomy. is spectrum that, uh, first of all, is already used by. Well, the largest uh, incumbent of spectrum is actually the federal government, and so part of what we did in our report is is urge the government to be, to lead by example and to show that this what we call spectrum access system technology could uh, be made to work. And in fact, within a let's see, within six months of our report to the recommendation, there were changes in the FCC that would allow that to happen. And that has continued to occur. And as I said, there's a big buy-in with the telecoms now because they can see the profits right on the other side of doing this. So we're, we're quite hopeful. Well, that's why I'd like to point back to this report because I think this may be the most impactful report that we did in the time that I was on the, with the council. Jim. Um, very, very nice to talk, Jim. I, I had a question about, I, I looked at the PCAST committees, all those beautiful photos of people really happy. I always imagine that it's fun to be around President Obama. And, and Joe Biden is always laughing. Joe's so. fun. <laughs> um, but I was wondering how much, I know politics isn't supposed to kind of enter this policy making and the science thing. Um, by the same token, we're in this very strange period where, you know, there's going to be a march for science uh, shortly in D.C. Um, there's a level at which people are okay, apparently, you know, just saying science is kind of baloney, 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 who cares, you know, and then other people are feeling very much on the other side of that. When you select a committee like that, yeah. I mean, was there any... Uh, was there any sensitivity to like getting people, say, from red states, the, the scientific leaders at, at, at from yeah. red states? You know? So one of the, to me, one of the disabilities that our country has is that if you look at the distribution of STEM expertise, it is not uniform across the country. And because of that, it is often difficult to find expertise that is geographically well distributed and therefore brings in the cultural um, impressions and background that you would find with a broader uh, geography. But that's not a problem we can solve. That's, that's even a problem with the National Academy of Sciences. It's a problem if you look at the distribution of universities in the country. You can simply look at a map and ask, which of our universities have the greatest technological uh, capabilities? You will find there's a great dearth of that in the traditional southern states of our country. The strength that we have in these areas typically is along the coast. 
and a little bit around the Great Lakes. This is a major problem. Thanks very much. I had a question about a comment you made in the beginning, which I found interesting. So you had said, I, I can tell you who isn't going to be the, yeah. the chief advisor right. for, yeah, yeah, and it won't be me. Right. Um, and it, so one of the things I, I, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on are, especially in the current climate, what, where do you think there is space where scientists can make good headway for promoting science policy, even if they completely disagree? Um, with the president, and where and what would you identify as the key challenges? So as you do that calculus in your head and think, oh, it's gonna, you know, it takes time to do this. Should I, should I be willing to serve in that capacity? Where do you think you actually could make headway? Where would be the challenges? Well, the real challenge, the biggest challenge is again, of course, the biggest threat to humanity, named climate change itself. It's been, it's completely clear that this administration is even in the process of shutting down the sources of information about climate change. It's cutting back on the parts of the NASA program on Earth observing satellites from which we derive the data to be able to prove that there's evidence that is going on. So uh, if you're a scientist who, if that's your area of focus, I would say this is a terrible time to try to become an advisor uh, in the, uh, the federal government. On the other hand, it turns out that if you're willing to look a little bit more broadly, particularly at the state level and sometimes at municipal levels, it turns out that places that are threatened right now, so for example, the Tidewater region of Virginia, um, some parts of Florida, it turns out that at least at the state and municipal, certainly at the municipal level, government officials seem to be more open to receiving that kind of advice. And so it's an interesting switch. So it's not that no one wants to hear, but we know who doesn't want to hear this kind of advice. So if, that's, if you're an environmental scientist, I would say aim somewhere probably other than the federal government at its highest levels. And then there are other sort of curious exceptions. Uh, so for example, um, this administration has talked about going back to the moon. And uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, first of all, well, it's interesting for a couple of different reasons. It'll take us at least 10 years to do that. Uh, I, uh, in the early, uh, in the early, well, I'm going to reveal something here. I applied to be an astronaut when uh, I was about 29 years old. And so I got a chance to go down to uh, Johnson Space Flight Center because they were, that's where we were having various evaluations. And I got a chance to talk to some of the engineers there. And I was stunned to learn that by 1980, we could not put a person on the moon because the guys who really, and they're mostly guys, the guys who developed the Saturn Vs and really knew the ins and outs of the technology, they had all retired by then. So we would have to actually rebuild that entire technical capacity to put someone on the moon. We're still going to probably have to do that. In the meantime, there's another nation in the world that does have a space program whose stated goal is to put a person on the moon. That country is China. And I suspect she is going to be successful. And if I was running a Chinese program, I would put a woman on the moon. Because you see, no country in history has done that before. And if you want to make a statement about the potency of your science and the places where your country are going, is going, that's one way to do it. There are other places where it's harder to make the call about whether there's uh, openness at the federal level for science. Anything that, that looks like science that, will, that has a short-term payoff in terms of um, translational uh, activity towards business, they're probably going to be extraordinarily supportive of that. Anything that has a longer time scale, I would expect them not to be so. So I like to try and keep a positive mind about things. So looking forward into a time when the current situation is not ongoing, uh, what do you think? Um, what do you think a timeline would be on reinstituting or re, kind of rebuilding the PCAST and? Um, say a four-year term is all that we have to worry about and after four years it can be rebuilt what kind of um, what kind of buildup will be lost from that and and how quickly will it be able to be put back together you know I I would like to also have a positive uh, a positive uh, statement to make to you but what I can tell you is this is a 40-year problem that we now face it's not a four-year problem that is the from my experience of being an American, the last time I saw this process was in 1980, and it's uh, 2017, and I am still living 
we are all still living under the impact of that election of 1980. This election just passed is as, con as consequential as that one, in my opinion. So it's not a four-year problem, it's a 40-year problem. Uh, what I, in the end, I uh, tell people that uh, I am hopeful, but I'm hopeful because of some strange attributes that this country has uh, demonstrated for over a century now. Um, and one of the ways to talk about one of these attributes is to quote Winston uh, Churchill, and, or at least to paraphrase him, because I'm not going to get the quote exactly right. But he said something like, you can count on the American people to find the best solution to any problem after they've tried everything else. <laughs> Jim, can I just jump in with a, a quick question? Can you talk a little bit more about who the audience really is for ah. these reports? I mean, of course, the president is the audience, but these are Thank also you statements so much. by the president. Sure. Thank so you so much for that question, because in preparing these reports, certainly uh, our reports, we were aware that there were multiple audiences to which the reports would resonate. Uh, I'll give you one example. Um, in 2011, I was in Korea uh, with a group, and we had the opportunity to meet with some officials from uh, one of the electronics uh, corporations there. And to my great shock, I got a question about STEM education because uh, the official was aware of the fact that I was on PCAST and we had done this report on STEM education. So it turns out that the audit, so when you write reports at this level, one must be peculiarly aware that there are multiple audiences, and therefore, as you write the report, one of the things that we did near the completion of all these reports is we had kind of a vetting where we would try to find interested stakeholders who would get a, a draft of the reports, not quite the final report, but where you kind of get a reaction from people who have an important stake in this, and if necessary, well, we always thought it benefited the reports because, as my colleague Bill Press used to say, you can get the antibodies out. That's one way to find the antibodies. So you've clearly done a lot of work um, through PCAST with science education and uh, collaborating with people in industry and with technology that's related to science. but. As a scientist, you and many other people work in what's considered like a basic or pure science, so an area that tends to be more abstract and doesn't necessarily have direct applications to industry. So where do you see the role of pure science in American science and technology, and especially in your advising role to the federal government, and to what extent it should try to sure. support those areas? So first of all, you're exactly right. I often introduce myself to audiences by a couple of different phrases. I like to say I'm the most useless kind of physicist that there is because I basically spend my life worrying about mathematics. But on the other hand, I also describe myself as a fallen mathematician because I am not a mathematician by any stretch of the imagination even though my work allows me to create mathematical ideas that mathematicians actually can't create. So I, I occupy this strange space between the two. So for me, it's kind of interesting that on the one hand, my personal scientific passion is totally unremoved from the questions that I deal with in my policy hat. But what I do bring to my policy hat is the same sort of skepticism and outside the box thinking that I exercise within my personal science. The reason I'm able to create pieces of mathematics that n no one else apparently has or done because I have always been an outside-the-box thinker. I've been aware of that since I was an undergraduate. I had experiences at MIT that basically told me I didn't quite think like most of the people who work on any particular problem. And so I bring that to the policy domain. And that's, in fact, what I claim would be the most valuable thing, unless you, unless you have a deep expertise in the policy area that you're looking at. The most valuable thing that you can bring to the doing of policy is this, this fierce desire not to be a follower of the conventional wisdom. I thought it was interesting, though, that on PCAST, you, as a pure scientist, are coupled with people, engineers, or even commercially oriented people who are presumably more applied in their, in their work. Yeah, well, that's, per, that's perhaps a, 
So I have this really weird, so I tell, so you all are listening to Jim Gates. I like to tell people Jim Gates is actually an app that runs on the core processing unit whose name is Sylvester Gates. So there's really this, this uh, in my mind, it's a very weird kind of dichotomy about who I am. Uh, Sylvester Gates is the, is the teenage kid who went to high school and got into fantasy and comic books and uh, loved mathematics. But Jim Gates is a, a construction of a more mature personality that very early in my life, I placed an extraordinary value on effective communication. And so that's the other thing I would tell any young scientist, that if you're thinking about operating in the policy domain, don't think it's going to be like being effective as a scientist, because you will doom yourself to failure. And in my case, the reason that I think I can successfully be paired with other people is because in those cases, it's kind of the Jim Gates app that's running, that's looking for big patterns, but looking for a way to communicate these ideas effectively to people who are not scientists. That's what I often do when I speak to the public about science, so this is not so unusual for me. Right. Great. Thanks. Time for one more question, then we'll continue in the reception. Hi. Uh, you mentioned uh, advanced manu manufacturing yes. as a response to the 2008 crisis. I was just wondering if you could just elaborate a little so I can get a sense of how you are linking the two. Okay, so uh, if you Google the expression advanced manufacturing these days, you'll find there's lots and lots of links to this. And uh, some of the ideas uh, involve, let me see if I can pull, pull out of my memory some of the things that uh, you know, are happening. Um, ah, additive manufacture. We are now, uh, as a society, getting to the point where, so in the old days, if you want to make something, like say a car, basically what you do, you take a block of metal, and you sort of carve, or a tool, you carve it away and you throw away, you create all this chaff that you just throw away. And then the thing that you're actually after is what you get out of the carving. These days, our technology is getting to the point where you can actually assemble that thing and therefore not waste all that material that you used to carve out. That's one, it's called additive manufacture, and that's one example of advanced manufacturing technology. We also do things with lasers that we couldn't do, cutting um, uh, items to more precision. There is um, an application of uh, computer technology called computer numerical controls which basically uh, replaces, it, well, in the old days, you used to have machinists that would create items. Computer numerical controls are, first, first of all, far more precise, but it actually requires technicians who know how to program computers to, uh, to some degree. So this is an example of how technology is changing jobs that normally you would have said the machinists in the middle parts of, this, of the country used to do. Well, now they need to know computer numerical controls to do that. Great. I would like to invite you all to a reception to continue the conversation outside, but I'd especially like at this point to thank Professor Jim Gates for sharing your wisdom.